And uh, since then, uh, in addition to working in Australia, has worked in Canada and in the United States on a wide variety of mammals, although he has dabbled uh, with waterfowl and reptiles here and there. And um, uh, he spent some time teaching classes, uh, including freshman courses, which I really appreciate, at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. Uh, and he's currently at Texas A&M University, where, is he, where he is one of only a handful of Boone and Crockett chairs uh, worldwide. So it's a, it's a really uh, unique position that he has with that and um, a very special one, at, sort of at the heart of conservation uh, and conservation policy, um, which he's passionate about. And um, on a kind of personal note, uh, that's, that's sort of how I first uh, met Perry. Uh, through some Boone and Crockett uh, committee interactions where I was filling in for our own dean, uh, who's a member of the club. And I always love seeing Perry at these functions because uh, he's a great storyteller. And um, the way that he engages individuals is just fun to watch. And uh, it's a real joy to watch him mentor students as they move through the fellowship program with the Boone and Crockett Club. So um, I'm really thrilled that he's able to be with us today. Uh, we'll see not only uh, is he a, a policy powerhouse, but a publication powerhouse with over uh, 70 peer-reviewed publications and, and book chapters. So uh, we're very lucky to have him with us today. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, all the way from Texas. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. So let me um, share screen. Is that right? Okay. Let's see what we can do. Can we see the screen? Okay. What have we got? No, we don't want to do that. Be good. Okay. Am I still with you? Okay. Let me forgive me while I do this. <laughs> uh, just to arrange this to make sure that I can see what's going on. Okay, so let's just get started here. So what I'd like to do, I recognize that climate change is a very large subject. And so what I wanted to do was to make sure that we could have some interaction about it. And so as Jennifer said, please do um, type your questions in the chat and I will break at about slide eight to get your interactions a little bit more um, and try and work out how we sort of make this a little less of a uh, one-way delivery and more of a two-way interaction, okay? So it's actually really, really um, appropriate that we are talking about this with such disparate types of technologies. So really this is a very large scale communication approach for what is appropriately a very, very large scale problem. Um, wild ungulates like these caribou have an annual migration of over a thousand miles each year. And the herds of these animals exceed well over a hundred thousand individuals. Um, the largest herd is, is probably the Taimir herd in Russia. And that's about a million animals. And it's reported that on one end, they are predated by Siberian tigers. And on the other end, they're predated on by, by bears and wolves. So very interesting sort of um, range for these animals. They're long lived. And so females can live for almost two decades in populations that seem to vary over 30 to 50 years, very long scales. So we are drawn to these animals lastly because they're large and they've supported large communities. Um, they're part of our identity and our culture. And because of that importance, we've been able to invest in monitoring populations, particularly in the last 50 years. And what that means is that we've got pretty good data sets on some of these things. They have wide ranging behaviors and because of those behaviors cover large, large territory, 
that results in conflicts, conflicts with land use. Uh, the classic ones are things like ecological value or hunter harvest um, with development for industry, oil and gas and mineral extraction in particular for caribou. So wild ungulates are culturally and economically important. And because we have long records, we can actually answer some of these questions that are very, very long range for them, um, climate change. Now, despite their large size and productivity, we're often surprised by apparent crashes. Um, they apparently reach tipping points when they lose their ability to tolerate further change. The legacies of these natural and human disturbances to these populations can last for several human generations. Again, very long scales of time. So for example, um, the 40 mile caribou herd that is found at the border of Canada and Alaska on the um, pretty much in the middle of um, the state. That herd was harvested at the turn of the century for the meat market uh, associated with a gold rush. Over the last hundred years, a herd that was estimated at over half a million still has not recovered to uh, it's basically less than 10% of that, of whatever prediction of that size was. It was somewhere between 300 and a half million, 300,000 and a half million. And so it's never really gotten much further than about 10% of that number over one century. So these things have some very, very interesting changes. And some of those changes are due to natural changes, climate, compounded with anthropogenic changes, things we do in land use, things we do in terms of harvest. So, Wild ungulates have also been used to conduct research specifically on changing climates. These are big animals and they leave big bones and teeth for scientists to find. So in Alaska, I'll point to this little um, cutout here. This is a bison that actually thawed out of the sediments of permafrost um, near Fairbanks, Alaska. It's a 36,000 year old animal. Um, well, comes from 36,000 years ago. Um, and this thing was thawed out of the permafrost because people were looking for gold. This is the result of placer mining. And there are many things like this coming out that basically tells you that the continent was very, very different or the state was very, very different. The image I'm showing is a painting by Randall Compton, which reconstructs the steppe bison in Alaska and they were there when this landscape was less shrub dominated, it was drier and more favorable for grass or sedges and therefore grazing animals like these step bison. Wildlife respond to changing environment over scales of time and space and people respond to those changes as individuals and as members of organizations. So from the local all the way to the international level. So what I'm going to do here is to talk to you, uh, remind you of what I'm talking about by using these icons at the top here. Whoops, back, sorry. So the icons at the top will remind you that what we're looking at is interactions. I'm going to talk about wildlife, but really it's wildlife in the context of a scale of time, spatial scales, ge geography, and also scales about people, what organizations are involved in actually using the information over the expanses of time and space that we're sort of talking about. So watch for these icons to get an idea of how um, I'm actually trying to weave the context of wildlife together with these three elements of scale. We'll first discuss each of these contexts and then talk about caribou and bison as examples. I'll take a break for questions, so don't, don't forget to use the chat function to ask questions um, as they occur to you, and we'll get to them in slide eight. Okay, now, a little reminder. We generally manage wildlife populations at a, at a scale that is not just of individual animals, but as herds or groups. And those may be regional groups of animals, or it may be uh, continental scales. What we know is that those populations are really the outcome of individual responses, births, behaviors, and deaths. As this diagram shows, 
population's size is given on this y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have time. Populations grow and decline over time. So for wild anglets, we try to use more than two decades of these data because they're long-lived animals. And what we try to do is we try to manage the population between two theoretical bounds. The upper bound, we typically call carrying capacity. It's essentially the limit for habitat, which is food supplies and space. The lower bound is this minimum viable population. And it's really dictated by the number of breeding individuals for a prevailing death rate. Higher death rates mean you need more production. Lower death rates, you might get away with small numbers of breeders. Okay, so between these two points, we can use the population sustainably. At the upper bound, we're really concerned about sudden increases in number, especially invasive species and changes in the quality of the habitat. At the lower bound, we worry about sudden losses of some very few valuable individuals that we have. And so isolated populations, populations that may be in relic habitats and in small numbers. Think about things like mountain ungulates, um, wild sheep, are very, very good examples of operating very close to minimum viable populations. Okay, so let's weave the concept of time and geography together by talking about a couple of definitions about environmental change. Environmental changes drive the availability of food and space for animals. So this is a view of a valley actually in the summer range of the Western Arctic herd of caribou. There's three to 400,000 animals that go through these territories, uh, these areas every year. The two definitions that are really important in considering these large scale problems are weather and climate. Weather describes the environment at the smallest scale of time and space. And that's the scale at which individual animals are responding. This is the point at which animals start to spend their energy reserves, for example, on thermoregulation because it's very cold. If that continues over successive seasons, then you're starting to see changes in the life history of that animal or the life of that animal. As it extends across larger regions through the entire life cycle of multiple individuals, we're looking at a population response. And that is really a climate response. So when we talk about climates, we're talking about, or climate change responses, we're talking about things that occur over large scales, typically decadal type scales. And we're talking about, if not just cohorts of individuals, we're talking about whole subpopulations of them. It's a bigger type of concept than just, it's cold out now. It's frequently cold and it's going to change how the way I make a living. Now, a couple of other definitions. And we'll explain a little bit about weather and climate by using an example. So I was in Australia visiting family early this year and we had an extreme fire season, uh, particularly for southeastern Australia. And during that period, smoke clouds would create these red skies. Um, they're very, very good as long as you're not breathing the smoke. So it's quite pretty, except inhaling it's quite dangerous. So this is one of these smoky suns, but I didn't take this over southeastern Australia. I actually took it over the Yukon River in Canada. The Arctic has very, very large fire seasons. Um, actually in this particular season, six million acres just burned in Alaska, um, not just Canada, in addition to the areas burned in Canada. Now in Southeastern Australia and in the Arctic, fires are typically driven by hot, dry weather, which actually cause animals to move or incur injury or death. This sudden event has a population outcome. And small populations, for example, may have been driven below that minimum viable population. We don't quite know yet for South Australia. There are regional die-offs in other uh, events like this. Large populations of animals can recover from fire events, but that really depends on the longer term pattern of seasons, 
and the frequency of those extreme events. So climate is the annual pattern of the fire season. And that means the frequency and intensity and duration of that fire season. So for example, um, the issue with the fire season in Alaska is that according to drift and climate, that fire season is actually starting earlier and going for longer than it has in the past. And that causes a change, not only in the way um, the animals respond, it obviously has an effect on the way we respond to fighting those fires and managing the landscapes. Okay, so weather has local effects, local movements, local die-offs. Climate is going to give you much broader effects where we're looking at the frequency from year to year of particular events. And these events are either direct or indirect on the animals. So a direct effect, for example, would be immediate deaths from smoke and heat. So basically loss of refugia. So the indirect effects are things like regeneration of grasslands and shrublands after a fire has gone through and essentially restarted succession. So these can actually be both positive and negative. So there are actually positive effects of some of these fires, but it really depends upon the intensity of the fire and the frequency of the fire. If it's very, very frequent, plants don't come back. So the next definition we'd like to talk about is predictions. So you can use weather records on a local scale to make projections of what's going to happen in that area. But at some point, if you want to go further in time and to make better inferences, you're going to have to actually relate observations to lo other local areas around. And this becomes an issue of upscaling. So what you're going to do is use local weather records to really push, for, or, uh, push in time and space further out. So upscaling has some benefits in that you can actually get a much better view of how areas relate to each other. You can also use something called downscaling, which is where you take a large scale data or large scale climate projections where you can see um, continental sort of shifts and try and predict what's going down at a particular location. So in the Arctic, for example, we will talk about changes that are occurring in Alaska, but we're really talking about changes in the Bering Sea, as well as the ice uh, in the Arctic Ocean to predict what's probably going to happen in a particular part, for example, the Yukon um, drainage in Alaska. So that is a downscaling effect. An upscaling effect is where we take all of the weather stations that we have um, across Alaska and try and predict what's going to happen for the Western Arctic caribou herd that's moving 1,000 miles. Obviously, these things are going to have different levels of uncertainty. And so that's one of the things that um, we come to bear in most of the climate change types of discussions. And that is, how certain can you be about these predictions? Well, that varies. It's never 100%, but we can understand the strength of a prediction for making a decision based on understanding which way did we actually come to that projection? Is it purely based on local data records, which means that it's very good in the small scale, not so good further out? Was it a compilation, which means that we upscale or downscale? So there are two ways of thinking about the system. Now, our management system responds to this information over a continuum. And the continuum spans from something called adaptation to mitigation. Now, adaptive responses are typically going to manage outcomes. And so we monitor the population and the environment closely to regulate use accordingly. So managing harvest is an adaptive sort of system. And it's very, very important because it's based upon carefully monitoring the resource and also the user. Mitigation responses attempt to control what's driving the change. So habitat restoration, for example, that removes fire-prone invasive species of grasses 
is actually an adaptive measure. But when it becomes prairie restoration, it actually serves, serves as a mitigation role because when you restore prairies, you put roots down and those roots have carbon. And so what you're doing is not only adapting by reducing fuel loads by getting rid of some of these invasives like cheatgrass, but you're also putting in something there that's also going to put a lot of carbon into the ground and that's going to take some of the greenhouse gases out. So adaptation and mitigation are two terms that are used. Many of the things that we do in management are adaptive. Mitigation is something a little bit different and something that takes a lot longer projection of effort, but it also forces us to figure out exactly what's driving the system. And that can be problematic at times. Okay, so let's talk about the science, um, the science policy and politics part. This is the social component. So I've already talked to you about the scale of time and space concerning environmental change. And I've then talked to you about how we define all those systems, okay? Now we're gonna put this together in a human scale. And the social scale of this is how we manage. So we share resources. And so we're going to actually have to use four different areas of activity to do this. So shared resources management, um, like at wildlife is the outcome of social institutions with four types of functions. Science activities are used to inform new information, sometimes synthesis of information. Policy activities use that information to create viable plans for decision-making, which becomes part of the political process. And once those decisions are made, those decisions could be um, purely to fund something or fund some activity, you have laws developed. And so basically it's regulating shared resources is a legal system. So action is laws. So scientists tend to talk about what resources we have, what resources we're likely to have, and what do we have now, and what are we gonna have in the future? The policy type questions that we have are, what are we going to do with what we have? And what's the best way to do it? So this is implementation of information. Further implementation is who does it? So politics is about who should use and act on what we have, who has responsibility, who has authority. Legal questions are, what are the rules for use, funding and action and what we have? So many scientists often think that once you essentially have figured this out, that's it. People applaud your brilliance and essentially enact all of these other three steps. That's not always how it happens. And climate change is one of those areas that actually all four of these things are happening at the same time. And understanding why some things don't happen is important because you understand where you may have a particular obstructions in this sort of social system. Okay, so this system is actually going to occur in a temporal phase. And so I'm going to actually split this up into actually three types of models. And those models are actually linked together. Okay, so this is a model of social action changes over time. And let's just look at this side on the left. And in an acute crisis, all of those functions are very highly motivated. And so delays between the four functions are very, very short. And what we have is each of these actions are essentially equally um, weighted. So there's lots going on in everything because in every one of those areas, because we all have a shared crisis to deal with. So one of the things that's important when you consider these crises is that the motivation um, is very, very high. But also information is sorted. And in a crisis situation, personal experience tends to be um, pushed to the fore. And also social histories and habits and trust tend to be emphasized in crisis situations. As things settle and you get into a chronic, more longer, longer type of problems, you seem to oscillate between these two types of 
paradigms where the emphasis is on laws and politics, which is decision making, or the emphasis is on science and policy, providing new information and new ways of doing things. So this is an information limited type of, of situation where you don't have enough information or you have enough time to wait for the information to come to make a decision. And here, you're still trying to sort that information and to come to an equitable solution. Okay, so let's put one of the polls up together. Can, you can I deploy a poll? Let's see if we can deploy a poll. Okay, I'm going to launch a poll. This is question one. And the question is, which model best suits the current state of the COVID-19 pandemic? Hopefully you can see this. We have our first response. Now, can you see the results of the poll? Is that poll results showing up on your uh, screen? You'll have to hit uh, end polling. There we go. End poll, okay. And share results there, I did it. <laughs> you did it? Okay, yep. can you see the, what do we get? It's mostly A, 47% so said A. Okay, so we have, a certain amount of consensus on A, but also we have people that have diversity of opinion and have also realized that, yeah, we're starting to move between B and C as well. Um, there's no perfect answer here. All I'm getting to, all I'm trying to do is to try and get you to understand that this is a dynamic system. And what's most important here is that people are starting to prioritize information in very different ways. And that makes some very, very interesting results. Okay, so I'm sharing the results. We're gonna stop sharing. And now I'm gonna ask you another question. And the second question is right here. The second question is which model best suits the current response to climate change in the United States? And I'm gonna take that over here. So you can't see the poll right now, is that right? Okay. So let me, so running, we have 45 responses, 55 responses. I think that's, okay, here's your answers. So a large, the largest group is basically B. And so most of us are sort of, most of you are thinking that we're at a state where politics and law is essentially um, the stopping point here, that there's plenty of science and, pa and planning involved. Some of you do think that science and policy needs more. That's true. There is there's certainly a great deal of effort going on in terms of um, the specifics of how you implement these things. Um, there is some benefit in in considering this as a crisis um, and that all parts are actually active. Um, but most of you see this as being the issue. Okay, so um, let me take you to another type of way of getting information. And this is something that was run by um, a program at it's Yale. Um, yeah, Yale University. Um, this website is freely accessible. 
And I just pulled this up. There's multiple questions here about climate change. Um, and this is Wisconsin. And this is Wisconsin's response to this question. Um, global warming will harm plants and animals. Will global warming um, harm plants and animals? And in Wisconsin, you're largely orange. Is if you look at the scale, um, some counties are coming in at about between 55 and 60 percent, and some counties are as high as between 75 and 80 percent. Okay, and overall in the United States, for this survey, 69 um, percent of the population's respondents are, are are affirmative that global warming will uh, affect plants and animals. So. If you said that um, we're limited by law and policy and decision making, then you have about the same number of people argue um, in that way for about the rest of the continent. So you're in pretty good, good company in this thing. Um, this is fascinating reading this uh, site and um, I can, if you want to take it down or I can distribute it later, um, but it is a very, very interesting um, tool to look at. Okay. So, the next thing I want to talk about is putting this together as a system. And so, this is what's called a social ecological system. And what that means is that we conceive it as a assemblage of loops or feedbacks between different types of things from these orange boxes for land wildlife and its habitat in green, and then the human components, the economics in the sort of bluish color, and then all of the social drivers, the, uh, the politics and the policies are here um, in this gray box. So wildlife are really part of this. And this green box is certainly affected by not only the feedbacks from the adjacent groups, but also feedbacks from groups that are distant away, from boxes that are further away. So for example, if there is a decision to allow the Army Corps of Engineers to, for example, build a levee, divert a stream, then the economics for that will feed, the, the decision here will feed to the economics and it'll feed all the way back up to here where you have a change in the landscape. Okay, and consequently, then you will have a change in the animals that are living in that landscape. So what this means is that the system is very, very connected and it's corrected over large spatial scales, geographies and large uh, organizational scales. Sorry. Now, what this means is that I'm really trying to give you a map because we're trying to figure out what is climate change doing? What one of the which one of these boxes is actually being most affected in the system for a particular issue? So we really need to find solutions in a multi-dimensional system. And the best way of doing that is using these sort of maps because we have to discuss this thing with each other. And essentially we'll have to point at this thing and it's better than pointing at a map than pointing at each other. So weather and landscape are part of this orange box at the top, wildlife and habitat are in the green, people and social institutions are in the bottom. The arrows connect all the boxes. They give a feedback function. They also have a feed forward function on each other. So you don't have to understand all the elements of the box. You do have to understand that it's moving in time. This system's dynamic and it changes over time. Now, that green box of wildlife is changing daily, but we usually consider it on a seasonal or an annual time scale hunting seasons, summer growing seasons, winter, okay? So for example, large game are typically operating on a five to 10 year scale, but small game may be much more dynamic. In general, habitat, ecological communities um, that create the habitat for animals are changing on three to 10 year time frames, okay? So what about our management decisions? Well, it depends upon what scale of management we're talking about. So our management system 
typically sets policy on four to 10 year types of intervals, implements those policies each year, but mostly it's set on a political term of appointment. So when you have a new governor or a new administration coming in, you have pretty much a four year set. In between that, you might have reviews of your particular wildlife agency every decade, okay, 10 years. So if you're looking at four to 10 year types of horizons for changing our policy or the way that we actually manage a particular system. We have crises in the middle of it, um, which largely it's shaped by a overarching policy that is typically decadal, okay? We implement an update between one and four year types of intervals. Now, when we have multiple states involved, where you have state compacts, or you have multiple nations involved, then typically these are decadal types of intervals. And so we talk about fishing agreements on a decadal type of scale. And implementation and updates of those are actually done a little less frequently, but the effort is much more comprehensive and the scale is larger, obviously. So for so fisheries, for example, you will have um, management plans for particular fisheries in, in parts of the Gulf Coast, for example, that'll occur on a decadal scale, and they'll negotiate um, or set uh, the fisheries or the catch um, on an annual type of scale, but really it's within the context of a running average of several years. So signatories to multi-state contracts or international treaty are really obliged to work within a particular time frame. So let's do a poll again. Knowing that the system is constructed in this way, can we answer the question that we started with? Can we actually manage wildlife at a climatic scale of space and time? Okay. So, we're almost half. Some of you are confident we can, and some of you, a pretty big mon a minority of you, are actually say we can't. What makes you say we can't? That's, a that's really interesting. Um, cause I've actually demonstrated, I've actually just described multi-state planning, multinational planning. What that means is that we've got a huge scale involved here and we're doing it at decadal scales. Five meetings would be 50 years. So yes, we actually, I would, I would say that we actually do have, um, the social systems to manage wildlife at a climatic scale. And actually we've been doing it for the last 50 years. Um, in fact, we've been doing it for about hundred years. The first um, actual international treaty for wildlife was for fur seals in Alaska. And that was signed with what was then the Russian czar and, and the, uh, the Japanese empire. So it occurred a long, long time ago. Um, 
we've been able to actually have these contracts for a very, very long time. Now, are they effective and what limits their effectiveness? That's a separate question. And so we're going to move to that by talking about, okay, a couple of examples for this. So if you said no, you're partly right. We have the system. There are problems with making it work. If you said yes, you are right. We have the system. There's problems making it work. Okay, so let's move on. So what I'm going to do now is to take you through these two examples. I'm actually first going to show you that that model I talked about of the social ecological system is actually a general model that we can actually customize for a particular problem. In other words, this is a general map of the general diagram of an elements of the map, but then we can actually put together a map of a particular wildlife system. And what I've got here in this more detailed diagram is actually a general model for wildlife systems. The wildlife is occurring at what I would say a local scale, and it's occurring in this biological dimension. So it's in the big green box here. And what you'll notice from this is that all the arrows converge on the green box, okay? And that green box is the quality and the quantity of the wildlife. So in other words, it's the genetic diversity of that wildlife population and the size of that wildlife population. What makes it robust? Now, some of the boxes that are feeding into it are things like predators, disease and pollutants, habitat, which is kind of really downstream upstream from the things that specifically provide food and shelter for these animals. In other words, the quality of that habitat. Okay, yellow box has temperatures, soil, water, and landscape topographies on it. And it's also got things like extreme events that directly affect habitat. The blue boxes have things like harvest in it because that is partly an economic activity it also has things like ecotourism and other indirect uses. Markets, laws and regulations, all of these things are in these social organizations in blue. And right at the bottom, we've got the values of the people involved and how those values shape the attitudes. So this detailed diagram really does not include all the feedbacks in the system. Um, yeah, it could be much more complex. I'm going to spare that. So, but it gives you a general idea of how the drivers work. Now, the most important thing about this is recognizing what's connected and also recognizing what you can control. So when you're discussing how an issue affects um, a particular wildlife population, then this gives you a map of saying, well, I think this is connected to each other. And the next question is, can I control it? So what I've done here is also put in these yellow circles with plus or minus signal, signal, symbols in them. And that tells you the bits that you can control in general. If you can customize this general template for your particular wildlife. And that's what I'm going to do for these two examples. Okay. Let's talk about Arctic caribou. It's an area that I'm well familiar with. Um, and it is something that is very much in the climate change um, uh, focus. This has been the global populations of caribou, um, so sort of circumpolar populations of caribou have received a great deal of attention from climate change work. And it's because one, they're very widely distributed, but they're also distributed in an area that has a very, very strong climate change signal. This is, there is definite warming effects in the Arctic and in particular areas where We've got um, quite profound effects on particularly human communities in some of these areas. So people are paying attention and these animals are certainly responding. Now, this system operates at very large spatial scale. And so herds are actually crossing, um, for example, the herds in Alaska across the Canadian border. Thousands of miles are covered, so big spatial scale. 
The number of animals is large. The Western Arctic herd has exceeded half a million individuals. Um, and the land is mostly under public ownership, but that ownership has different authorities. So federal lands are managed by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and the National Park Service. The state and tribal lands actually border many of those federal units, but their management priorities are quite different from each one of those federal um, managers. And so a Western Arctic herd that passes through all three of these management um, jurisdictions is really passing through multiple areas of priority for human land use, okay? What that means is the control points are very limited. This system has large scale, few people. So some of the impacts may be actually very, very small in space, but may actually also have a very long time signature. The very small control points, excuse me. <laughs> um, The control points that we might have in this system may be some control of predators. We definitely have a control of harvest. The state, for example, is in charge of harvest. And we have some control of land use with these different jurisdictions. And because much of that is in the public sector, it's public lands, um, public policy has a very, very big effect on how those land uses occur. So the control points are limited and largely the biggest driver in the system is the environment. So climate projections and records of weather are particularly important in the system. Okay, so winters are classically very, very long and severe in the, in the Arctic Carib populations tend to be more affected, of course, by changes in the summer. So although animals die off in the winter, the summer period is where they regain and they survive. And so regain mass for survival and reproduction occurs really in the summer period. There are small changes in the offset, in the onset of spring and, and spring will actually affect how long a period these animals have to regain this mass. So warming, in the Arctic is advancing the season for forage availability. However, it is also advancing plant senescence. And so when the quality of that forage declines, that's occurring a lot earlier. Warming is also changing the window for biting insects. And so harassment of caribou that reduces their foraging time is also increasing. So what that means is that in most cases, particularly for the Western Arctic herd or the Central Arctic herd, the gain window is becoming earlier. It's also becoming shorter. That depends on location. And what that means is that movement options are very, very important for these animals to offset this variation in plant production. Caribou can be very sensitive to human disturbance and they avoid infrastructure which then further limits their foraging in summer, and it may actually limit their movement between alternative foraging ranges. Here's an example of that mix between human disturbance and the context of the population. Populations of Arctic caribou can grow at 8% per year. If you had a stock that grew at 8% per year, you would keep it. Unfortunately, that stock can fall at faster than 8% per year. And that's what this diagram is kind of showing you. This is the central Arctic herd and it has its migratory corridor right down the Trans-Alaska Pipeline Corridor. And this herd was actually about five to 10,000 animals at about the start of the pipeline. And during the entire development of the pipeline, this herd continues to grow, which is contrary to predictions, right? But it kept growing right up until about 2010. We did actually some work around this time period and we actually were able to describe the forage base for these animals about the time that they were starting to come down. And you notice that in a very, very short period of time, less than five years, this population has lost 
somewhere around 40,000, two thirds of its um, size. So what that means is that there is a very, very strong contextual perspective for looking at these herds. Disturbance when the herd has already got a good favorable foraging base will only slow that gain. But disturbance over here, when it's already coming down, may actually accelerate this gain and bottom them out. And so looking at this in a long series is really, really important in understanding what is the signal of human versus natural um, change in the systems. So in Arctic caribou, the science component of the system is really emphasizing the disturbance is contextual. It really depends on the trajectory of the population and the location of that population. What is it that you're actually disturbing and how important is it for the annual changes or the annual movements of these animals? Warming of the climate has both positive and negative effects that really depend on location. So increased variation in forage quality is likely, but that also makes the system much more hard, much more difficult to predict. And that's because these animals move. And if they can move, then you can attenuate some of that disturbance. Now, fortunately, we have a few tools that allow us to assess uh, and monitor these populations. And some of those approaches are really important in simulating the effects of disturbance to understand what the long-term types of effects are of putting oil fields in these, in these areas and expanding these oil fields. Now, most of our control is really focused on land use and development. Harvest is an issue when the herd declines, but um, the development has a much longer time signature. For example, we can reduce harvest more quickly than we can reduce the effects of development. So development is also very, very expensive. And in many of these cases, the approach is go big and go, hook and go home as soon as the price drops. So when we do our policies for land development and land leasing, what we have to do is to balance the economic gains with some very long-term economic externalities on the land and these wildlife populations. We have to rely upon trying to continually assess whether the system has the ability to absorb the impacts of those changes. Climate projections are particularly important in this system. Okay, so that's a system where management is very, very coarse. Here's a system the management is actually at a finer scale. This is a very old system. In fact, this is the system that North America, the North American wildlife model was based on, bison. Um, again, a very large system that spans most of the temperate latitudes. Um, bison on the icons of conservation in the United States. And what I've shown you here in this, in this um, cutout is a Albert Biostat's um, painting of the, of the last of the buffalo. And this is a massive painting. Um, the canvas is uh, somewhere around 15 feet by 10 feet. It's a huge, um, it's, all, it's cinematic in its, um, its impact. Biostat used it uh, to convey the scale of the Western lands, but he also used it to convey the, the scale of the tragedy of over-exploiting bison. And this is where the social system became enacted into starting to do change laws to protect and allow restoration of some of these herds. Now, bison uh, are still endangered, some of them anyway. Wood bison are still listed under the Endangered Species Act, uh, and they're largely distributed in Canada with experimental herds in Alaska. Plains bison are distributed from Mexico to Saskatchewan, uh, and that's all due, mostly due to very introductions. The herds on public lands are managed by national parks and state parks, but bison are actually one of the few native species of wildlife that can be privately owned. There are 10 times more bison in private ownership than public herds. The 20,000 public animal, public herds 
have basically stayed at that level since the 1930s, whereas the private herds have increased um, quite dramatically with a whole series of markets. And the fact that at least 20, 25 states, you can actually have both private ownership as well as have public herds in that state. Now, if you recall the very, very simple diagram that we had for caribou, this is what the system looks like for public and private bison. Public bison herds don't have many blue boxes. So the system for public um, bison is largely depauperate of these blue boxes, whereas that's what's emphasized here in these private bison. There's big differences between the system. And what you have to realize though, is that this is actually a system that's maintained in parallel. The two components are actually quite separate. There's a larger number of private herds and they have a wider diversity of uses and thus many more economic factors than the publicly managed system. Private bison are not transferred to public herds and live transfers from public herds of bison are actually quite limited. The two components operate quite separately. However, they're actually complementary. So the separation is actually also occurs um, in the public herds themselves, depending on the manager. So in South Dakota, Wind Cave National Park and Custer State National Park are actually right up against each other. They're contiguous. But the bison are actually separated by a fence and they manage the separate herds. So both public and private herds of bison are really affected by the same sort of environmental things. So if you look at the tops of these diagrams, they're kind of the same. Both public and private herds of bison are affected by long winters, fires, high temperatures and droughts. The orange boxes are kind of the same. What differs is a little bit of subtleties about how you manage things like predators and disease in the two systems. But in general, what you're looking at is a very, very simpler, similar environmental type system. Now, that means that both elements of the system are being driven by climate in the same type of way. Bison are directly and indirectly affected by rising temperatures. So the color figure here, that's an infrared image of a young bison and those bright yellows on the back, um, those indicate hotspots where the animal is having very, very high heat transfers. So body size of bison changes with temperature. Bison have shrunk from the last ice age. But in modern times, last few decades, body size of bison also declines and it's declining with drought and warm temperatures across the Great Plains. Unfortunately, the Great Plains is predicted to become warmer and more frequently affected by drought over the next 50 years. What that means is just like the caribou, those summer foraging windows are going to become shorter as grasses senesce more quickly for both bison and also actually for domestic cattle. So bison are likely to become smaller, but what's more important here is the most productive place to be a bison is moving north and east. So the sweet spot for bison is you've got Yellowstone and all the parks on this edge. The sweet spot is moving this way. It's coming towards you. So optimal habitat for bison is actually not in the West for the next 50 years. It's actually going to be moving in this direction. So most of our public herds are on the Western edges of, this, of that distribution. What that means is that herds with the greatest conservation value um, face a degrading habitat. So Fortunately, private lands have quite a few bison. And what that means is that the conservation value of those private herds may be a great asset in not only helping us shift some of the conservation types of emphasis to these herds, but also in using those herds to restore the prairie wildlife systems. So as climate shifts over the next 50 years, we, this system has already got some assets that we can use. So if you put the two elements of the bison system together, really they have large amounts of economic feedbacks 
lots and lots of different stakeholder groups involved and the ability to have a large enough distribution system to probably contend with some of the things that we're expecting from climate change. The bison system has many more parts than the caribou system. That diversity means that there's a possibility of this thing to adapt to some of these changes. The adaptive responses may include using private herds for conservation goals and to build the drought tolerance of the population by using those southern herds. Bison will also provide opportunities to diversify ranching economies. Bison are more tolerant of extreme winter and summer conditions than cattle. Uh, bison also graze in patchy patterns that facilitate plant diversity. So they can be used for prairie restoration that provides both carbon sequestration for mitigation of climate change, as well as simply adaptive measures of building up the hydrology and the biodiversity of areas. So some of the economic barriers to public management of bison though, arise from the authority to transfer publicly owned animals with a strong genetic value to private owners, simply one way. But authorities for doing that um, are still lacking. The use of bison on public grazing lands is also a source of conflict for cattle grazers that are increasingly reliant on those leases as climate warms. Bison are already used in restoration programs, but the number of participants is actually limited to large operators because USDA has not provided approval and support for using bison um, as a conservation tool. So the bison system has the potential to transform the way we think about conservation in North America. So a final question, what do we need what do we need to know? What do we need to manage wild ungulates on a climatic scale? Um, well, can we do this? Well, yeah, we do. We have established systems to actually confront the challenge of climate change for wild ungulates. We have very, very strong public interest in these animals. We have lots of private institutions that will advocate. And we have public institutions that are really based upon wildlife as a public trust. So yes, we have really a good system that we can do this with. Downsides, the public decision-making is hampered in this area by distractions that largely prevent conservation policies from rising to the top of the agenda. There is a lot of distraction about uh, uncertainty and also creating crises that are not, ex that not necessarily uh, helping understand the situation um, in this system. And that's actually becoming counter to making decisions. Particularly for wildlife, uh, wildlife is not really ent entering into agenda setting. And so it's not just getting onto um, uh, policy agendas at all. That being said, the system has a great ability and well demonstrated to do adaptive management. We can certainly manage at the scale of time and space that is necessary to turn around, particularly wild ungulates, but also the where they are keystone animals in, a, in things like the prairie system, we can also turn around those systems that they live in. So, there's a really strong um, message here that adaptive response is, is well established. The downside is that we really don't have much of a mitigation response. And what that means is that in some areas, that adaptive response may not be sufficient. This is particularly true in areas of uh, parks and refuges that uh, essentially been set up many years ago. If we do not have the ability to expand those lands, or essentially buy new lands in different areas, we're not going to be able to um, track the best productive areas for these wildlife. So that is going to mean that mitigation really is one of the things that we need to do. Imagine wild angulates has the potential to change the conversation about mitigation and climate change because these animals are important 
And I think bison are a good uh, flagship for that because they're also the national mammal. So that's one area that I think we can certainly make a contribution to the climate change argument. We can actually not only adapt, we can mitigate, and we have good systems to do it. So much of what I've actually shown you is concepts um, from my course, which I teach in policy. The examples that I showed you um, are really detailed information about biology of caribou and bison. And here are some of the papers that uh, pertain to that. Uh, Jeff Martin is the bison guy, um, and the guys above it are the caribou people that, we've, that I've worked with. So thank you for listening, and I have run a little over time, so I'm going to switch to take questions. So Jennifer, can you speak? Yes, I can. <laughs> okay, uh, for, there you so go. I would like to say that, uh, first of all, again, thank you very much. Like normally this is where you hear all kinds of clapping and so I'm, we're clapping in our own home. So okay, sure. good. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, if, so there's uh, one question, a couple uh, questions coming in through the chat. So go ahead and, and enter your questions in the chat and we'll try to answer them um, as we can. So I see okay, there's a couple coming down. in. So, uh, Is there a limit to the types of wildlife populations that are managed under this system? For example, is this system used for birds and small animals, or is this system only used for larger animals that have social and economic value? Um, no, you can actually uh, adapt that, go backwards. Um, you can adapt that diagram for anything you like. So I'll go back to, um, this is modified. So. Uh, this template can actually be changed and you can change all the boxes if you like. Um, in general though, it's organized in those different colors because um, we're looking at the economics, um, the social, the psychological, so the individual values, um, and then the elements. So this is, most of these boxes are there in most systems, but you can emphasize and de-emphasize them based upon um, your particular type of wildlife. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, are there any specific ungulates that could benefit directly from climate change? Okay, so the climate change uh, issue is, includes both positive and negative. So as things warm in the short term, um, in cold places, as they warm, you're going to expand for ungulates the food base. So the short-term projection, for example, in the Great Plains, particularly in the Northern Great Plains, is good. In 20 years, um, there will be more forage. But as you go beyond that, it's gonna get hotter and hotter. And as you get hotter, now you're moving into conditions that is going to favor uh, shorter growing seasons for those plants. So the upside is that animals that are living in areas where it's cold and temperature limits plants, they're going to get better, but as it proceeds past that zone, then it may actually decline. So for bison, if the animal is distributed throughout the range, then that range quality is going to change. And so places that were good for bison um, are not going to be good anymore or as less good. Uh, so for example, as in the Arctic, we're seeing a uh, expansion of shrubs and particularly along riparian corridors, so rivers and streams. And what that means is that we have an increasing number of moose in the Arctic. So climate change is actually good for moose in the sense that it's expanding those areas. Downside, as it gets warmer, the shrubs that they eat actually tend to have a much more varying uh, quality. And that means that you see much more of a influence of temperature, water, and insects on the defenses in those plants. And so now you've got something that is a lot more difficult to predict. So um, as you get warmer, moose can move into an area, but then what they're eating may actually decline in quality and constrain them. So. I'm not sure if it applies to bison as well, but I know some large mammals in our country and Canada 
uh, starting to lack genetic diversity due to their being stuck in small pockets, would this help counteract this problem? Um, in bison in particular, the active management has to occur in there. And so we're seeing a lot of translocation. Um, you see a lot of this occurring with particularly sheep, desert sheep um, and uh, yeah, particularly desert sheep. Um, very, very active management to try and sort of move the genetics around and make sure that you're not building vulnerability. Um, so yes, I think genetic diversity is an issue. And one of the things that we're talking about, particularly for um, bison was phenotypic diversity. That means that um, the interaction between genes and the environment, the development of the animal is actually just as important. So particularly, for example, Southern bison, um, the future of bison is actually what's happening in the South for those herds. In other words, um, drought tolerance may actually be an attribute we want to have. And so um, being able to conserve the phenotypes that are drought tolerant, uh, smaller body size, ability to tolerate heat, those things may actually be important for some of these small, uh, what are currently small populations that we may need to emphasize. So yes, there's some issues about that um, small populations. Has there been any changes in body mass in other ungulates other than bison? Does the body mass highly impact bison populations and their survival? Yes, um, there are island effects for, um, for lots of these things that are compounded by temperature. So uh, yes, there has been changes in a variety of species um, associated with temperature and body mass. So in general, um, that phenomena of warming has been implicated um, in body mass changes for several species. But it's best demonstrated for these big things because you have enough of a range um, of size to measure. Does the body mass highly impact bison populations and their survival? Um, we don't know that yet. So that's something that we don't fully understand. There's quite a few trade-offs in life history that occur. We do know that there's some interesting life history shifts that are occurring with uh, things like with other taxa, um, particularly the shift in the phenology of plant growth um, is advancing things like for age of first breeding. So we're looking at things that will actually cause animals to breed at a smaller size faster. So there's some implications, but it may also make them vulnerable to things like uh, winter survival. So we don't know the implications of body mass change to life history patterns fully in these species, but it's something that we're pushing towards. Uh, besides bison wandering off, what are the other problems with bison being on smaller tracts of state county owned land? Simplified, why is there not bison in many areas that aren't national parks? Actually, there are bison and private bison in every one of the 50 states. So um, private bison ownership is extremely um, popular. Um, part of the reason is that uh, bison, bison burger sells at $9 a pound. The average for beef is $3 a pound. It's three times more valuable. Um, it supports a smaller um, herd. So another economically, you can, you can run a smaller herd and still make a, make a reasonable living. Um, so yes, bison are actually a lot more popular than we suspected. And that's actually one of the reasons we proposed this. It's that um, there already exists uh, stakeholders um, in all 50 states for this sort of native animal that's been reintroduced. Um, the thing about bison um, in these production herds is that um, unlike beef cattle, for example, um, production is only one component of it. The brand that they've developed is lastly that it is a very, very green product, meaning that it is not grain fed. Um, they don't use, um, they don't use uh, the um, hormones, hormones to increase growth. Um, so there's a great deal of uh, involvement with what is ecologically and environmentally suitable for these, for the brand. And that's a big change. So 
these guys are extolling conservation values and ecological values that are unusual for producers. And so um, that's one of the reasons that's interesting. And Shelley says ticks too. Yes, there's lots of disease and ticks. Um, so we have uh, increasing concerns about things like um, the tiny predators, if you like, uh, insect harassments as well as arthropod harassments. Um, do you think there is a direct correlation between large ungulates like bison or domesticated cows and temperatures getting warmer? I presume you're um, maybe referring to um, methane, uh, methane uh, releases. Um, there's some evidence that methane is uh, nine times, I think, um, more potent in terms of greenhouse gas warming than um, CO2. So yes, um, there is some evidence though that bison are actually produce less methane than cattle. And that's actually true for many um, wild ungulates. And that's largely because um, they're not feeding on grain. And so that's a different hygiene balance in the rumen that tends to change uh, methanogenesis. So wild ungulates um, typically, that if you're not filling them with grain, will have less of the methane contribution. Does this system work globally for ungulates? It seemed like most, if not all the examples for North American species of ungulates. So could you employ this model elsewhere? Yep. Are there any species that might encounter issues or so do poorly with this system? Um, it's a generalized system. It's just really a way of planning it. Um, all systems have these elements in them. Um, it just so for example, the caribou system that I showed you that was very simple. Um, this is a public, um, publicly managed public resource. And in many areas of Europe, this is what you might look like, right? Um, but there might be more stakeholder groups in the blue boxes and below it, but it may be run much more publicly. You can adapt this system for different um, approaches. What role has native traditional ecological knowledge, knowledge played in the response to climate change in Alaska or the Arctic? Quite a lot. Uh, there's a lot of co-management, particularly um, of the porcupine caribou herd. Um, for the last, that was the first herd. And so um, that was actually worked on lots of co-management systems. And so it's been about 40 years now, um, almost, of being involved in a co-management type of approach. So um, traditional ecologic, ecological knowledge um, has particularly been used on the herds that um, are on both sides of the Canadian and the US border. Um, and that means that it's involved both uh, state or provincial agencies, federal agencies, as well as tribal um, groups on both sides coming together. And those have been very, very interesting um, interactions. And uh, the porcupine caribou herd uh, has a good website that describes the process and their current work. The same is true for the 40 mile herd. Um, that has a co-management type system as well. Do you foresee in the future as climate change moves the location of the best habitat for these animals uh, efforts to relocate populations as a conservation strategy. Um, it may well be that some relocation could occur, but the truth is, um, uh, I think um, Wesley Powell basically argued about 140 years ago when he surveyed the continent that there wasn't that much good agricultural land left. Um, we've pretty much owned up most of the place. So we'll be having to buy tracts of land or um, reallocate the use of public lands for these conservation purposes. Um, that is certainly feasible. And I don't think any one approach is going to be the answer. I think a suite of approaches might have to be um, adopted to create both private, public and NGO type assemblages to achieve conservation goals. Um, we have largely relied entirely on public um, lands for these conservation values. And essentially they're under, underfunded and overtaxed. 
in terms of their usage. There's, too, there's many, many uses involved. And some of those conservation uses now can be moved into the private sector, but that's going to take some very creative approaches to changing authority and also funding. Um, and that means that we may have to fund by using um, some approaches that are essentially corporate um, as well as uh, partnering. A good example of this is um, Ted Turner. Uh, Ted Turner is actually the largest landholder in the United States. Um, he has the largest number of bison as well. And largely that's because he runs properties um, that have a very, very strong ecological bent and he uses bison as well as um, other uh, wildlife to have a very diversified management system. They still run in this, the objective is still to run in the black, um, but they marry a whole suite of different strategies to have multiple uses to maintain uh, an economic sort of basis for their operations. Now, that is achieved by being very, very large as well. And so um, those approaches uh, are important. They serve as a precedent. Can we cooperatize that so smaller, smaller owners can actually then collectively achieve the same sort of outcomes? Those are the sort of things that are coming up. And I think you've got the private system in place to essentially do that. Uh, you've got values that are in place to do it. What are managers of bison herds in the western part of the US where habitats will be declining uh, doing in preparation for the next 50 years? I think a lot of them are actually, um, a lot of them are aware of it. I'm not sure that um, people are projecting at that time scale. And I'm not sure that um, we're actually managing um, in that sort of frame quite advertently yet. Some people are, mostly the public landowners are actually managing at those sort of timescales now. Um, but that doesn't mean that the private landowners aren't sort of recognizing the need. Uh, National Bison Association, uh, coal management boards for caribou are both sort of uh, talking about these systems all the time. And uh, again, we have to worry about um, management in terms of two scales crisis versus, you know, acute crisis versus longer term management. And between the crises, people do think about these things. <laughs> um, but uh, and I, so I think that is happening. Okay, so we're very close to the end. Um, I think we've done all the questions. Yep, we're right at 527. Okay. So just thank you. Here. So I, yeah, thank you everybody for being very gracious with your time and for thank you for coming today, um, for part, you know for uh, coming to the presentation and thank you all and thank you, uh, Dr. Bervoza, so much for coming and for being and for your willingness to participate in this and to and to be our you know our keynote speaker. This uh, was really successful and. I'm sorry we weren't able to have you on site. <laughs> so, oh, um, and I don't. I, I wanted to give Scott an opportunity to say something if he wanted to. I neglected to introduce him at the beginning. He is the director of the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. Um, so I wanted to give him an opportunity to say <laughs> thank you, or if there was anything he wanted to say. Well, I certainly appreciate uh, Perry coming on and joining us with this seminar series. <clears throat> it is the fifth seminar series that we've conducted um, in the College of Natural Resources. We certainly intend to do the same next spring semester. I hope we'll be able to be doing it face to face rather than by Zoom or, uh, you know, some virtual uh, perception. But um, nonetheless, uh, Perry, I think you did a fantastic job of conveying this and helping to bring our seminar series to a close. And, Really do appreciate everything that you did and all the uh, participants joining us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then for okay. just for those of, of you that are still uh, hanging out, I was just going to say that this video is actually being recorded or this whole, uh, and it will be posted to our website. Uh, so if you go to um, UWSP slash WCW, you'll be able to find all of the uh, lectures from the entire series on our website. Um, 
So with that, unless there's, I don't think any, uh, if any of the, the, Jason, you have any final questions or well, comments? No, I'll just say uh, thank you very much, Perry. It was a, a great talk and I really appreciate how you simplified a very complex system uh, to be uh, widely digestible uh, by all of us. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, we'll say goodbye. And so I want to say thank you again to everybody. So, and thank you for coming. Have a wonderful evening. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, Jennifer, are you able to, to leave the window up for just a second here? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, Perry, were you wanting to catch up in this window or do you want me to send you uh, Send me another, send me an invite and I'll, I'll, I'll stay on Zoom. Okay, all right, will do. Okay, thanks. All right, I'll catch up with you in uh, one sec here. Okay, all right, so with that, Scott, everybody else, I'm gonna check out, so I'm gonna end the meeting, so I'll see you guys later. All right, so long. Bye-bye.